Hi, I'm Anna Raimondi coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is Father Nathan Castle. He is currently a Dominican Catholic priest, lecturer, workshop facilitator, and retreat director and author. He has written Afterlife Interrupted, Helping Stu Stuck Souls Cross Over, Eternity Pause, Helping Stuck Souls Hit Play, and his brand new book, which has, which has just hit this week, is Afterlife Interrupted Book Two. So you all have to get that and get his other books if you haven't gotten them already. Over the past 20 years, Father Nathan has helped many souls who have died suddenly, and he helps them adjust to the afterlife. Father Nathan believes that providing such help is something that the Holy Spirit has given him to do. He believes that we are eternal and that the creator who made us loves us wildly beyond belief. His mission is to help people in the present feel loved and dwell in joyful hope. That's a wonderful message, especially given all that's been going on today. Well, Amen. welcome. Welcome, Father Great to be with you today. I'm thrilled to have you with us today. Um, I'm wondering, um, on the cover of your book, you use the phrase, interrupted death experience. What, is that, what does that mean? Well, I figured that people that would be interested in my book probably also have an interest in near-death experience, that movement of consciousness outside the body, usually during a physical trauma to the body. Um, that's there, we have about 50 or 60 years of uh, of writing about people knowing they're sensing things without being in their body, um, sometimes moving down a path, sometimes toward an attractive light, sometimes with guides or deceased loved ones or religious figures. Uh, the people that have come to me actually did die. They did the first part. They left their body and couldn't get back in. Sometimes they say it was locked. I tried, but I couldn't get back in. So they died, but they, they've they done only part of the rest of that narrative. They haven't gone all the way to some um, next level. And they had their reasons, which, is, which uh, are discovered in the course of talking with them and helping them make a plan. So in this place of limbo that they're in, are they frightened? Some. One of the things that I've learned is um, when it comes to, the, to death and the afterlife, people can be real quick to presume that it must be the same for everybody. Mm. And I find that it really isn't. People are as different as they die and shortly after they die as they were before. Um, we have things in common, but there's, we express ourselves lots of different ways. Um, they're, uh, sometimes they're frightened. Uh, almost always they're at least shocked because I only get people who were alive one minute and dead the next. Car crashes and shootings and stabbings and drownings and all of that. Um, you know, like just to go back to what you said, what I find so interesting is so many people are afraid of dying because they're afraid of losing themselves, their identity, who they are, their personalities. And yet, you know, when I tap into that realm, they come back full personality you know they sure. retain their personalities and i you know i've read your books and they they do come back and they communicate with you in their personalities they do and their personalities can shift a little over time um after uh, i should just let your audience know the the they come in the night they show me a dream um it's not my dream it's in my consciousness but it's not my dream material uh it usually shows me at least how they died, maybe without the gore. It, they're not terrorizing, but mm -hmm. um, anyway, they show me something of what they think I need to know to help them. I write it down and then I get with a prayer partner as soon as I can. Usually there's a several weeks lapse because it's not the only thing I do. But um, we, when we go into prayer, we protect ourselves with St. Michael the Archangel, Holy Mary, a whole cluster of angels and saints. I don't pitch up, pick up hitchhikers on this plane or in the next plane. I don't think it's safe to just throw yourself out there for any wandering spirit. But we protect ourselves and then 
Um, I and some of my prayer partners have the capacity to allow our voice to be borrowed to let a person talk long enough to say what they need to say. Oh, so, so um, your, does that happen with your, with you or with your prayer partner? Most of the time with me, um, because I, I, I can allow that. Um, some of my, both of my sisters have that capacity, that gift. So if I'm with somebody that also has that gift, we have to kind of tell the person, if, if you wouldn't mind, would you go over there? You know, if we're sitting across from each other, uh, uh, decide which of us you'd like to speak through. But it's a little easier to, to, uh, to for me to facilitate uh, if somebody else is doing the, allowing the speech through, but it works it, uh, anyway. But anyway, that um, I feel like uh, what I've seen is most of the souls that I help needed extra care more than, most normal people would because most of us don't die sudden traumatic deaths most so of us the don't. commonality between them that that's what that's uh, that's the the only, i hardly ever get people that died a natural death uh almost always i get people that died a sudden unexpected death so what prompted this in you when did this begin uh in this form it started about 22 years ago maybe 23 um in childhood, there, I was raised in a Catholic home and given really good training in uh, spiritual things, according to the Catholic tradition. So I knew I had a mom and dad on earth and a mom and dad in heaven. And we talked to the mom and dad in heaven, you know, every night. And I knew that after people died, you could still talk to them. You'd, they were just kind of, uh, it was same but different somehow. Uh, but then, then the first of these specific people that died in a trauma came when I was in my early 40s. I'm almost 65 now. So some 20, almost 25 years ago. And did it come in the same way in a dream? It came in a dream, yeah. And that's the way it continued to be. You don't, you don't see them in your everyday life. No, you, as you might imagine, once you enter into this world, you start meeting everybody's everything. You know, I, I deal with people that, you know, can't go to the grocery store without seeing spirits wandering about or uh, there's lots of different ways that spiritual things uh, happen. I've met a number of people that also help people cross, uh, and each of us have a, our own way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I just met a guy the other day that he gets first and last names in his sleep. Just first and last names. And he writes them down, and then he Googles them and finds out that they've died in the last week or two. Wow. So yeah, you know. All he does is pray for them. Yeah, you know, we all have our own gifts. We do, I mean, you know, as a medium, you know, I try to give people the hope and the peace knowing that there really is a heaven because yeah. so many people, they believe their relatives just go into the abyss and that's not the case. But I'm wondering, you're a Catholic priest. Yeah. How does the church support you? Um, do they accept you? How does this work for you? I've been really happy and grateful for the support that I've gotten. I belong to uh, the Dominican uh, community, the, the Dominican order, and I have obedience to the provincial of our Western province. The United States is divided into four provinces. So my, my vows are to our regional leader, and um, he and his predecessor have both endorsed my books, and uh, that's really all I need. It's, that doesn't mean that every Catholic, there's 1.4 billion of us around the world. Not everybody approves of what I'm doing, but you know, how do you find that 1.4 million people that agree on much of anything? Right. <laughs> I'm content with the support I've gotten. You know, when your, when your book came out, I was very excited because um, I think it showed people that there is validity to this. If, if, if a Catholic priest is saying, this happens to me, you know, there's validity in that. And there's bigger acceptance across the board, you know, because, you know, sometimes the church kind of pushes this stuff away, you know, and listen, there are charlatans out there and a lot of it is for protection of people, but you came out with this and it gives credence to something that um, can help people and that is beyond our awareness. Um, have you been, have people commented on that to you? 
they do frequently. I, I waited a long time. Uh, this started happening in the early 40s. I've been a campus minister most of my career. So I've been a Catholic priest running campus centers at Arizona State, um, UC Riverside, and Stanford. And I felt like being too public about that while I was in those roles might get in the way of my primary job. And so I just did it in the background and the Holy Spirit seemed content with that. Uh, and I, I kept good notes and um, trying to leave a, a, a body of material that if anybody wanted to study it after I'm gone, I have it organized in a way that would make it easier for a researcher. Um, but um, I'm, I, I believe I'm doing a holy work and, and our motto is truth and I'm only telling the truth. So if anybody wants to take me on about it, well, okay. You know, Jesus uh, had a rough time of it. People didn't believe him either. Mm -hmm. they, they thought he was up to no good. And so on. anyway, I just try to just do my job. And part of it involves helping these souls that are stuck. So you look at this as part of your mission. Absolutely. Particularly, you just mentioned it, the idea that I believe everybody survives their death. And it's not a matter of what religion you were trained in or none at all. I just believe it's physics. You and I are the kind of being that keeps going after we die mm -hmm. and we don't disappear into the mist or you, I think you use the word abyss. We continue to be ourselves in a, a way that's similar but different. And I think we have the opportunity to continue to grow and evolve, um, leave behind stuff, um, repair broken relationships, um, heal from stuff that wasn't healed, you know, folks in addiction who pass an addiction, they don't have to deal with a chemical problem in a body anymore because they're not in it, but they still have the consequences of um, what addiction did to their relationships and how it thwarted their own spiritual growth. And so those things can be dealt with uh, before or after a person dies. So how are they dealt with after? Similarly to how they are here with truth telling, People just, uh, one of the things about that I've learned is that whatever the ether is after we die, <clears throat> like you and I are surrounded by air right now, well, we'll be surrounded by something else. We, we were surrounded by uh, amniotic fluid when we were in the womb, and then it was air, and then it's something else. And whatever the something else is doesn't allow falsehood. You can't talk to somebody in what I call the kingdom of God and not tell the truth. It just doesn't, the physics don't support it. It dissolves mm -hmm. before it gets to you. <laughs> I watched a guy once wanting to call himself shit. Well, that's an expression that people use when they feel very down on themselves, but nobody that says that is that. It's a metaphor. And he was trying to say that and it dissolved halfway across the room. And he said, how many times am I gonna do that before I learn? And I said, it just sounds like you have to be more precise. I know what shit is, and I, and I know we are not that. And so just describing more clear language. And then he said something like, I feel terrible about myself. And that worked. So this place that they're in, is this the Catholic purgatory? The word doesn't get used because only a Catholic would use it to begin with. Uh, and I don't, don't deal with only Catholics. I deal with, you know, it's not only Catholics that die. <laughs> Everybody does. Uh, uh, I, the simple answer would be yes, I think so, because purge, purgatory is from purge, which means to cleanse. And I've watched a lot of people feel that that was a nap metaphor they needed to, especially people that died a mess, a bloody mess sometimes. Um, and part of what they felt like they needed was to get cleaned up. Um, that's not the only metaphor. Um, much of it is growth and just growth in truth. It's sort of like, you know, if you, if you did have some horrific accident, like on the highway, but you survived it, somebody would come and scoop you up and bring you into an ambulance. And then they'd take you to an, uh, an ER and then maybe into um, surgery and then ICU. The people that I deal with have been through a sequence of healing modalities, and I feel like my partners and I are like the discharge staff. The people that make sure you know what to do when you leave the hospital because you don't need to be here anymore. There's a better place for you. You don't need what we can do here. 
uh, that we help them kind of gather themselves and get ready for um, the next part of the journey. And what about somebody who wants to be forgiven by somebody who's living? Do you sometimes connect the living to those who have passed? Not really. I mean, I've maybe done that a few times in my life, but um, no, I'm on this, this plane, uh, on this activity right now, uh, I'm not being asked to connect any of these people to their loved ones. I've asked the Holy Spirit, is that what you want me to do? Do you want me to get names and addresses and, you know, uh, phone numbers and stuff? And I've been told, no, not yet. Yeah, because so, I think that's that's coming. It could. Uh, and I've also been told that that could come without you initiating it, that it might just oh, happen. So. that's going to come. I can tell you, just by what I'm feeling, that's going to come without you initiating it. Well, if it did, I'd be more comfortable with it because I'm not trying to be... Um, I'd rather help people develop their own spiritual gifts than have myself looked at as some sort of a guru or somebody that, you know, I don't want to, to have people uh, come to me and ask me to contact deceased loved ones or anything like that. And I'd like to stay a Catholic priest in good standing. And if I started doing stuff like that, <laughs> I yeah. would just be handing my head on it a plan. It would be different if they said to you something and then you meet somebody and you you know it gels, like the story gels, yeah. and then you open up your mouth. So you don't like put a sign out, you just talk, you know, that kind of thing. Well, that's what happened when all this started. I didn't, I didn't go seeking this, it came to me. And so if that ever happens, it, it, it could be joyful. It, it, it's a little bit like though, like people that look up, uh, that know that they're adopted and they start looking for their birth family, it can be a mixed bag, you know? Yeah. Not everybody's delighted to no. have contact no. from somebody else. Not your place. But you know, I you're evolving into something really big. And it, it must have changed over the years. Has it evolved in some way? The biggest change that comes to mind is that my I just I was telling you just before we started the show when we were talking, uh, that I that I had the subtitle of the previous book was helping stuck souls cross over. And in this one, we chose to keep the same graphics and stuff for the book. And we, we crossed out the word stuck because I thought initially that all of these people were in this in-between space because they were stuck, like a vehicle that can't get traction. And some of these are not stuck. They're just in the place that's right for them for right now. For their healing. For their healing. They needed something incremental uh, and weren't ready for uh, a complete passage. They needed to take it in stages. And how long does it, how long, like once they get in contact with you, how long does it take for them to be able to move on? It's really up to me and my partners to schedule the time. Oh, uh, really? It's up to you, not up to them. No, when they come, they're ready to pass. Uh, but they're also told now it might take a few weeks of earth time and, and not everybody pays that much attention to it. After you die, you might want to pay a lot of attention to what's going on upon the earth and what time it is and all that. Others just don't. Kind of like like right now. Don't you know people that don't have much of a sense of what time it is? Yeah. And other people that are very punctual. And, <laughs> right. yeah, um, I'm punctual, but I never know what time it is. Or what day, what day of the week it is or whatever. Uh, who's, you know, pe some people are great at remembering birthdays and others just don't have a clue about that. Yeah. It's sort of like that. Some well, people. Personalities. Uh, anyway, uh, it's usually more on my end. Like right now I have about eight to 10 in the line and I really need to get on. And, you know, COVID has slowed stuff down. I have to do everything on Zoom. Uh, I was trying to get this book finished. It, you know, it's just life. You, you, mm -hmm. These things have to find their place. So, uh, but we hardly ever keep anybody waiting more than a couple of months tops. Wow. Uh, so they wait that long. They but they don't, they don't, they don't, but they don't experience it as like being kept on hold. It's not annoying. Um, Are some of them angry though? Do they come through angry? Recently, one of the, in the new book, there's a story of a sheriff who was uh, shot on his sister's front lawn and he was furious. Um, and they, they told him, we, we don't use anybody's story without getting their permission. So I talked to them the first time to help them do the crossing that they need to do. And then if we think we're gonna use their story publicly, we go back and ask 
to, to talk to them once again, just to ask that one question, may we use your story? And do you use their real names? Unless they say otherwise. Sheriff didn't want to be called anything but Sheriff. Uh, he didn't think feel the need of it. But he was so angry, but he was also insistent that he wanted, when he understood that he had only partially done a thing, he wanted to finish the thing, whatever it was. He, so he was kind of both angry and impatient. And they told him, well, that's just fine, but we're not gonna let you, you, you took an oath to serve and protect. You know, that's often on the outside of a police car mm -hmm. you know, to serve and protect. You took an oath to serve and protect people and we're not gonna let you go into that man and be enraged. You're gonna have to tamp it down. And he, it was almost like, you know, when you're watching numbers like your temperature when you've had a fever. Mm -hmm. or your blood pressure numbers. He had some kind of number that he needed to get to in terms of his anger. And as soon as he got to the decimal point, he he was demanding, now, Steve, <laughs> I'm ready. And they said, well, you're just barely ready, but you have to promise us that you'll be a gentleman and you won't go into that man and be all enraged. And so he was able to pull that off. I would think since you're telling the stories of how some of these people have died and using their names that people would recognize them. Has we, anybody ever recognized someone that you wrote about? Not yet. Although when we, we mentioned that earlier, that might happen in the future, but sometimes we alter some um, detail that might make them recognizable if they think that's best. Okay, so you're going on what they think. Yes, it's their story. Okay, so you write you write about a man named Ray. Yes, he was my very first. Okay, um, his story was, was was there was a lot of detail in his story. Yes, there is. And but I he died in 1960, so somebody'd have to be paying attention 60 years later to that detail. Not, but it's not that long ago. I no, mean, but they'd have to be. You know, they'd have to be 70 or 80 now to have that memory of him. No. So. Maybe well, Maybe that'll happen. Um, well, how old was he when he died? He was 20. Okay, so I'm not that far off in age from him. All right. Okay. So I would think that, you know, as your books start selling and selling and selling, that like his story, and I remember reading it thinking, like somebody's gonna connect to this because there's enough detail. And then what are you gonna do when they make the connection? Like, will you entertain it? Will you talk to them about it? Are I you guess, allowed to do that? You know that, uh, that, that phrase, you cross that bridge when you come to it? I would, I would cross that bridge when I come to it. If, if, if somebody called me up and said, hey, that, that Ray guy, he was my great uncle or whatever, <laughs> what, I, would, I would simply be in the moment and I'd say my prayers and ask to be led and do the best I could to help somebody. And I think that would be pretty wonderful if that would heal old wounds that have been carried on for, you know, 50, 60 years. If people, if, if that's the way it played out, uh, I, I could be okay with that as long as I felt like I could defend myself against whatever people might want to, if, if, if anyone was to try to take me on and say I was doing something wrong, I can say, well, I, what, it, what exactly what did I do wrong? <laughs> he was trying to help somebody. So was he born in 1960 or died in 1960? He died in 1960 at 20 years old. So he was oh, he's way old. older than me. Well, I thought so. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I thought you said he was born in 1960. Like, <laughs> I'm thinking, well, these people are still around. Yeah, that might be a little old. Um, but, you know, some of your other contemporaries, you know, the contemporaries in the book, that may happen too. I think that's pretty exciting. Like if people would make the connection for you. I, I think that would be sweet. And there's one who would be well known. We chose, she and I had that conversation. You would, you would know at least the event. And we did consider, should we try to connect with, um, in her case, parents and others. And we just decided to let it ride for the time being. Uh, so well, there's, there's one that's already kind of like in that zone. One last question. Do you work with the Holy Spirit? Do you work with a spirit guide or anything, you know, with Mary? Do you? Oh, yeah. Uh, there, it's really a whole clan. In fact, there was a stirring in me right now because there's just like a whole bunch. I, 
certainly Michael the Archangel. He's the protector against uh, uh, spirits that are um, unwhole. The, you know, unholy, the word holy is from whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe we're to love our enemies. And so I'm not, I'm not angry or antagonistic toward any of the forces that are uh, unhelpful and unwhole. But um, I use the angels and saints and the person's guardian almost always comes through and does what I call a mic test. They, they show them it's really not that hard to borrow his voice, just watch me. And their angel will come through first and just chat for a little bit, not to give a message, just to do a test, just to, just to show this isn't very hard. And then the person usually follows. Sometimes the person doesn't feel the need and they come right out. And then once in a while, one of the canonized saints comes through. St. Rose of Lima. She's a big oh, help. Really? She's a sweetie, yeah. And St. Maximilian Kolba. Um, there's different ones. Uh, Mary Magdalene has helped. Um, they're just, they're, 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 you know, we're used to seeing them in stained glass or period costumes. And you're not going to have to wear that outfit. It's pretty, but you don't have to wear that for all eternity if you die in it. <laughs> you, you, you can you you continue to have thoughts and ideas and and ways of expressing yourself you know forever yeah i started seeing um mary the blessed mother when i was five um uh -huh. okay. and she didn't appear to me the way she looks in a church uh -huh. um, very very different docks olive skin long hair not with the blue dress on but with like a brown kind of not very expensive thing with a, a hemp belt, very differently than yeah. how she has been depicted over the, over the ages. But it's more of the feeling of, I feel like the angels and the saints, how they bring that feeling through of, of love. You know, Mary comes through with a feeling of, of love, which is also, you know, so I deal with people in, in heaven you know, and heaven is this place of pure and absolute love where there is no anger. So it makes sense that, it, or pain or anything like that, because you're with, you're with God and God is this being of love, you know? So it makes, like when you talk about where they are and stuck or whatever the word you want to use and they're experiencing the things they did in life, they heal from that. So they're ready to go into that realm of love. Would you agree with that? In, in part, although I believe God is everywhere, and so there's not just, you don't cross the border into God land, you know, God's mm -hmm. already present all the time, and God is love. Um, these people that, that I deal with are just, um, they're just growing in love, and part of that is leaving behind um, parts of the story they tell themselves that are unhelpful. Uh, one thing that you can't do is reconcile with someone if the other party isn't ready, and sometimes they say they'd like to apologize to someone and they're told, that's a lovely thought, it's just premature. Hold on to that and we'll let you know when it's time for that. Because on the other end, the, the other party has to be in a good space, receptive to, to you know, a, a, a yeah. healing of a relationship. Do you see yourself kind of like a spiritual therapist? I, I, I've always thought of myself that way, not just in this realm of dealing with people that would have died in spirits, but people that walk into my office. You know, a lot of times, a lot of people can't afford therapy, and mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of people don't have insurance, or their insurance only allows them six fifty-minute hours a year, uh, or whatever. And so, clergy end up being uh, doing a lot of heavy lifting in the world of of what would often be called therapy. And, and that's a part of my job that I've really loved over the years. I was in therapy in my 20s a couple of times, and I saw what helped me, and I just tried to pass it along uh, to other people. And then I had a little bit of training, but not an awful lot. Most of it's sort of on the job. Well, I thank you for all that you're doing, and I, I do hope you write many more books. Um, you will, I mean, we'll be hearing about you for years and years and years and years and years. So that makes me very happy because you're helping so many, so many people, not only on the other side, but people who read the books, who get an understanding of what's there. And also people who feel that they, they can't go there. They can't believe this. You're taking down some barriers that I think really helps people because this is true and you're speaking your truth. And that is, I mean, 
That's wonderful. All any of us can do is say what we have to say, and we right. can, it's not up to us to make other people believe us. It's, right, but it's nice to put the sign in front of them. What yeah, they it is. Believe, they yes. believe, but we need more of these signs and these signposts that say, you know, you can follow this way and it's okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, so thank you. Um, sure. Do you have a website that people can I do. Use? I do. People can learn more about um, my books and, and uh, video series and stuff at nathan-castle.com. It's N-A-T-H-A-N-C-A-S-T-L-E.com. And then on there, it will link, there are, you know, links to Facebook and YouTube and uh, uh, whatever, uh, Instagram and all that. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much for coming on today. I couldn't wait to speak to you and you lived up to um, my preconceived notions of what it's all about. So Let's do it again. This went, so, this went so quickly. I'd love to, to come back and we could talk. Okay. Uh, I'd love that. All right. Good. All right. Thank you. All right. God bless you, dear. God bless you.